I think one of the major additions to the second edition that um, is obvious to any reader that uh, picks it up is the addition of the new chapter on ethics. Um, yes. That's something that I would like to uh, just delve into a little deeper with you uh, mm. just now. Um, I'd like you just to uh, perhaps talk a little bit about why you felt it was necessary to include an additional chapter, uh, following on, if you like, from the more pragmatic concerns uh, mm. uh, that, that, that uh, concluded the first edition. Mm. Um, and then perhaps we could talk about your understanding of ethics as applied to translation. Okay. Um, as I said, the, the, the last 10 years have seen a lot of uh, developments and changes in the way the discipline functions. We now have a discipline and in the way the profession functions. Uh, the fact that we now have a discipline uh, in its in itself requires us to think and engage with issues of ethics because there's hardly any discipline today that doesn't have uh, a component of ethics in uh, the training it delivers to, to its students. So even things like computer science, business studies, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, medicine of course, engineering, all disciplines uh, have to deliver some component of ethics because that is part of the uh, maturation process of a discipline to, to, be a to show that it's able to reflect uh, critically on, on what it does. Uh, in terms of the profession itself, of course, there ha we have seen increased professionalization in recent years in translation and interpreting. Um, uh, and, and that means that uh, translators and interpreters are more accountable than they used to be. They are more visible and more accountable. Uh, accountability means that you have to be able to reflect on what you do and take decisions that you can then answer for whether legally or in other ways. Um, and from teaching um, a lot of students over the years, I know that when they go out onto the market and uh, work as professional translators, they often come across situations that they have never anticipated. Mm -hmm. uh, situations that are not taxing linguistically, but they are taxing in terms of their ethical implications. And because they haven't anticipated them, and they haven't rehearsed arguments and thought critically about the impact of what they do on others, uh, they often make decisions that they regret later. Um, and that's even more important actually than legal accountability because at the end of the day people live with themselves. Mm -hmm. They have to live with themselves. And if they end up uh, making uh, the wrong kinds of decisions and, and they, they have no way of going back and mm -hmm. putting things mm -hmm. right, that's quite uh, uh, an unpleasant thing to live with. Mm -hmm. And so I felt that it is important to add something that reflects now that increased professionalization in the discipline uh, and the fact that it is a discipline, something that shows that we can reflect not only on the kind of mechanics of what, you, what, what we do, but can, uh, that allows us to reflect on the impact of what we do on others, because that's what ethics is. Mm -hmm. And you asked mm -hmm. me about my understanding of ethics. Ethics is about the impact of what we do on others. Um, and this kind of difficult balance that we have to keep between the rights of the self, my rights personally, and the rights of others that I come in contact with, and the rights of different others, because often the rights of different people clash with each, with, with, with each other. Uh, this is what ethics of, is about, and it's a very difficult area to reflect on um, responsibly mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and be able to. It is something that we have to negotiate all the time in our daily, daily lives. But translators and interpreters are in a, a very important position of having a major impact on the lives of others, the welfare of others. They work in situations like the asylum system. They work in courts. Uh, they work for minority groups. Uh, just about everything that they do has an impact on the lives of others, uh, on the quality of life, on their survival, uh, and therefore they have to really think very, very carefully about the implications of what they do uh, for others. I think this ties in very nicely with the whole approach of the book, Rini, um, where you're moving very much uh, from what was previously a sort of prescriptivist standpoint towards description and towards thinking about numerous options for mm. dealing with particular situations, mm. whereas in the more textual-based uh, parts of the book it's about strategies, mm. uh, translation strategies. Mm. When we go into the chapter on ethics, we're talking much more about options of behaviour, uh, yes. roles that uh, interpreters yeah. and translators uh, take. Mm. Um, do you think that that's an area that uh, has been neglected in translation studies uh, teaching? Mm. Um, 
I, I think, for example, very much about the way in which ethics has been approached um, in terms of a sort of rule-based um, system in the way that, you know, yes. uh, if this happens, do this. Um, and yes. is that something you're trying to counteract? Indeed. Uh, I mean, my approach in, the, in this chapter is completely different, and I actually start by saying that uh, translators and interpreters cannot uh, assume that they can simply rely, uh, fall back on uh, codes of ethics, codes of practice that are provided by the different associations, uh, but they have to learn to think uh, critically mm -hmm. uh, for themselves and decide for themselves obviously within kind of a, a broader uh, uh, awareness of the entire discipline, entire profession, but they have to think for themselves what is ethical, what is the right way to, to behave. You cannot prescribe these things because every situation is unique and every person you encounter and deal with is unique. So there's no way you can uh, prescribe uh, behavior uh, in issues of ethics. You can um, draw kind of broad outlines of what is the right thing to do in general, but you can't prescribe behavior uh, in specific situations. And therefore, what I've tried to do in this chapter is uh, it's the same kind of approach that I, that I adopt in the rest of the book, which is uh, it's not a prescriptive approach. It's about giving students uh, a, a set of conceptual tools with which to reflect on a particular area of practice or a particular area of behavior. So I've tried to do the same here. And like the rest of the book, again, the, uh, the, the, the arguments are based on concrete and authentic examples. These are not situations that I make up. These are situations that uh, are actually documented documented by uh, professional translators and interpreters. And so I, I use these authentic examples to allow students to uh, think through the arguments, particularly when you have controversial positions. Uh, it's very important to be able to think through the arguments for and against a particular position, even if you know in yourself what it is that you prefer or what you think is the right thing, it's always important to see the other side and to rehearse the arguments for the other side. And so I've tried to build that also in the exercises as at the end. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. some of the exercises at the end of that chapter are about taking uh, controversial, sometimes high-profile situations and um, uh, rehearsing the ethical, not the, the, the textual uh, arguments, but the ethical arguments for and against particular types of decision. Which, of course, are evidenced in textual behaviour. So uh, yeah, the fact that uh, a translator makes a certain decision mm. textually mm. will impact upon mm. the ethical behaviour, or it, it mirrors, if you like, or yeah. embodies that ethical yeah. behaviour. Some, some, uh, some of the decisions are, are uh, made at a very macro level. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, there are there's the decision to accept yes. or not accept yes. an assignment that, mm -hmm. that, you know, before you even get into the textual uh, issue. But a lot of the decisions are made at the level of uh, the text itself, the textual choices and their implications for others, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, I think one of the other changes that I'd like to talk about or the, uh, if you like, modifications in terms of updating um, mm. is the addition of further references that you've included mm. in the book. Um, I think as a lecturer who's been teaching based on this book uh, for a number of years, that's something that's very welcome. Um, I found that what I was doing was adding sort of references mm -hmm. toward it adding newer references perhaps to uh, the kinds of topics that you were selecting. Um, I think just to kind of come back to the perspective of the lecturer using this book, um, the feedback that I've had very much from students is that it's very user friendly, very um, um, clearly and coherently argued. Um, and that they find it uh, quite easy to apply despite there being quite complicated um, linguistic uh, concepts being explored within um, the text. Um, how do you feel about uh, its suitability for students with no background in linguistics whatsoever? Mm -hmm. Is this a, a, something that you deliberately set out to do? Indeed, that's why I argue for a top-bottom uh, approach in the book, uh, starting with very, very uh, low-level, uh, um, uh, very small units of language, and very carefully and, uh, and in a detailed way working through the different levels until you come to quite complex things like theme ream yes. uh, yes. organization. For instance, that's one of the most difficult uh, uh, chapters and, and longest chapters of the book. Uh, now, some students, um, not everybody's got uh, aptitude for 
linguistic analysis mm. and some students will skip a chapter like the theme dream analysis although uh, I, I hope that I've made it as user-friendly uh, as possible um, but the, the book on the whole is designed for students who don't have a background in linguistics mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but also I hope allows students who have an aptitude mm -hmm. for this kind mm -hmm. of thing to take it further to, mm -hmm. to develop it further I mean I think this is also um, or, or students with uh, less of a background uh, in linguistics are also helped by the comprehensive glossary at the end, for mm. example, um, mm. and, and explanation and definition of key terms throughout. I think that that's mm. something that you do do, uh, even more basic uh, linguistic terms uh, that they may not be acquainted yeah. with. Yeah, and the concrete examples, yes. of course, yes. because it's the concrete examples that, that bring a theoretical notion to life. Uh, I mean, obviously, you deal with English in the book, um, and your examples are of translation from English into mm. other languages. Um, and when other languages are used, you provide English back translations right. of those um, uh, examples. Um, do you see that as um, limiting the book's applicability, the strategies mm. that you talk about, for example? Are they um, particularly related to English and translation from that language? No, I don't think so. I think a lot of the strategies will apply to uh, a lot of language combinations. Um, and I think that the uh, use of a wide range of languages is enriching for all students, irrespective of their own language combination, because translators need to be sensitive and aware to the way language works in general. And being able to see this with languages that they don't even speak and be able to follow what is going on in the language can only enrich their uh, awareness of how language works and their sensitivity mm -hmm. to words, things that they may not even be aware of in their own language, but when they see it uh, analyzed mm -hmm. in relation to another language, they may become more sensitive to it in their own language. And, I mean, that's something that native speakers of English, my students have said yeah. to me, <laughs> that it's actually taught them about their own language and uh -huh. how it works <laughs> and to recognize particular elements of that, of that language. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's been continued then, I presume, <laughs> in, the, in the second edition. Yeah. Many thanks, Mona. I think we've managed to cover everything we wanted to cover today. We've yeah. talked about the additions to the new edition uh, of uh, In Other Words. We've looked at the new chapter in a little bit more detail uh, on ethics. And we've looked at the kinds of different texts that we've dealt with um, in translation and are continuing to deal with um, in translation in 2011. So thank you very much. We're all looking forward, I think, to uh, now reading and using the new edition um, in our translation teaching. Thank you very much. Thank Mona. you. Thank you.